Hi, this is Laptop Radio. Today's topic is music as a language. And we have Ed McGuire here. Hi, Ed. Hey, Michelle. It's great to talk to you. Thanks for coming in and joining us. Always a pleasure. So we're going to talk about music, but before we talk about music, can you introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. I'm, uh, I think I, I know you from uh, a lot of the, the work that you've done in the blockchain community. I uh, just maybe a bit of quick background. I have worked in technology and finance for uh, the last couple of decades. I was a research analyst for a while and uh, covering a software and technology and, and worked doing consulting. And, and before I made my switch into finance, I was, I'd been a musician all my life. So I was, uh, uh, worked in the music business for a, a record distributor or a CD distributor back in the 90s. And I actually have a, a BA in music from, uh, from Columbia where I went to school. So it, it, it goes all the way back to the very beginning. So uh, it really stands out, like just your knowledge and love for music. I I could I could tell. <laughs> well, it's one. It's a lifelong passion, right? And it's one of the. It's one of these kind of miraculous things that, if you think about what music is, it it's just moving air, and it has this really magical ability to. Uh, you know, to impact people, to, you know, to, to summon up memories, to, you know, to make them laugh, dance, cry, uh, you know, basically evoke the deepest emotions, the deepest experiences. And it, it crosses all cultural boundaries as well. And it, it crosses language boundaries as well. It's, uh, yeah. So what, what happened was last time my friend and I were talking about how even though you don't know a language, you can still listen to their music and mm -hmm. understand it and feel the music as a language. So I thought that was really interesting because certainly I listened to a few songs in different languages and yet I understand and could feel the mood of it. And you shared a few songs as well when I posted about it. So how how is that be you know it's it's really remarkable i i think you can uh i mean you can you can identify some universal reaction to to music and it's one of the things that's really fascinated me that music has you know has been this this language or a part of the way that we communicate and you know as as humans just you know going back as far as far as we can remember, I, uh, you know, I once I was once at a dinner with Michio Kaku, who had, you know, the physicist who seems to have an opinion on everything, and I, uh, I asked him what he thought the origins of, of music might be, and in a way, it's, uh, you know, it, it's music at first was a, you know, was a, sig a signaling me uh, mechanism or a way to, you know, a way to uh, communicate, but. I think what's really remarkable is that there are, you know, what uh, the way Western music has, has evolved where we have, you know, uh, octaves are divided into these 12 steps and we have, you know, you, you've got these, these, uh, you know, very common harmonic uh, devices and, and, and melodic devices. Um, you can feel emotions like, uh, you know, like sadness, like, uh, like joy uh, across and, and it, and it and it conveys these emotions, you know, regardless of of the syntax. And I, I think it's it's really interesting if you think about kind of how you know closely tied to uh, to language certain types of music are. I, I uh, in college I first encountered uh, you know certain types of African music, like the music of the Yoruba in Nigeria. It's really interesting because if you've ever heard of you know, the talking drum, the Yoruba language is a tonal language, just like many, uh, you know, many, you know, certain Asian languages, um, you know, for instance, you know, Mandarin or Cantonese, for instance, or Vietnamese are, are highly tonal, right? Where you can have the, you know, the same, uh, you, you know, the same vowels and consonants, but depending on whether your tone, your, your tone is going up or down, it means something completely different. And in the Yoruba culture in Nigeria, the talking drum replicates the rhythm of speech, but by uh, by being able to uh, actually 
uh, you know, I I I imitate or, or uh, replicate the, you know, the tonal cadences of words, you could actually, you can speak through the talking drum and the drum itself is going to have semantic content to it. So it's pretty amazing. If you think about, you know, listening to a, you know, you listen to a drum, we hear rhythms in the West. We're sort of used to, okay, well, that's a, that's a, that's a cool groovy rhythm. But if you, if you, uh, you know, if you grow up in a culture with this tonal language that, uh, you know, where you understand what the rhythms mean, you could, you could talk to each other, you could send messages by a talking drum. And, you know, I, I think that that's a, that's a level or a depth of, uh, kind of semantic, uh, you know, it, semantic meaning that that's that's really unique to the language. But but if you think about uh, just what how music can speak to you from you know people that you can't speak, you know, that where you can, where you don't share their language. For instance, if if you or I were to walk into a uh, you know into a room with you know. Peter Tchaikovsky, you know, speaking 19th century Russian, we, we wouldn't understand a word, <laughs> you know, or, you know, <laughs> running into a cranky Beethoven, you know, some, somewhere in a, in a coffee house in Vienna in the, uh, you know, in the, in the early 19th century, we, we, we could not understand a word that, <laughs> you know. but the music that they wrote has this really this timeless, ability to 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 move people and i i think it's it, i mean if you if you think about music in that context it isn't that surprising to come back and say well you know if you listen to you know somebody singing you know french chansons or or um you know so i i think i shared with you some brazilian music and some african music and uh you know some great some some indian music some bollywood music i mean there's so many you know terrific uh talented people that you know that express their feelings in their own ways but it can you know it could touch you in uh you know if you get if you get used to the particularities of the you know the style and the genre and, and maybe the rhythms and instrumentation that might be unfamiliar it really could be uh you know it's miraculous how how universal the language is so what are your, what are some of your favorite songs um in a different language mm. other than english um sure. that you love that remind you of love oh wow well you know i have to say you know you go to what are, what the what the romantic languages are the romantic uh um uh styles of music i i'd, I'd say like brazilian music has got to be like i mean it's it's there's it's love and it's just the most sexy kind of music as well i mean if you if you Go back and listen to the, you know, the original. Think about the bossa nova uh, and the, um, the, if you if you listen to Astrid Gilberto singing, you know, the girl from Ipanema in, you know, in Portuguese. You know, it's really you don't know what she's saying. I mean, they, you know, she also sings in English too, but it's it's so you know it, it's got so much impact and and you know there I, I think a lot of the uh, the music by uh, Antonio Carlos Jobim. You know, Corcovado and and uh, you know um, Chegos de Cidades and uh, those are those are those songs are are pretty pretty timeless and I'm a huge fan of of Ivan Linz who's a, a songwriter who sings sings his own music but uh, mm -hmm. uh, Marisa Monte is also a tremendous uh, I mean just a just a brilliant singer and songwriter. Uh, who I saw perform earlier this year in New York. Um, so the Brazilian, the Brazilian music is is just is just a terrific uh, culture. I mean, the MPB, which is called Music Music Popular Brazil, uh, is you know has a, a, a you know, great number of folks that uh, you know they can that sing in that and that style. And and there's a cross, a little bit of a crossover to jazz. I think of uh, this pianist. Uh, and singer Eliana Elias, who uh, kind of cut her chops playing, you know, serious jazz in, in New York, but she, she also sings, and she sings these Brazilian songs and plays piano. She's terrific. I mean, if you think of kind of like what Diana Krall does it with sort of traditional jazz, you know, uh, Eliana Elias does it, uh, well, she also sings in English, too, so she's, she's pretty amazing. Um, How about songs that signifies a lost um hmm. heartbreaks oh yeah so with love right sometimes uh -huh. oh yeah Heartbreaks. well uh, you know i'll tell you the, again you uh 
there's um you know i i love you know there's uh there's a lot of wonderful uh you know latin music some salsa um by you know for instance uh you know some of celia cruz or or uh, uh la india that um you know those although that they're <laughs> that's more dance music but when you when you really do think about sort of the sad um sad songs uh there's a there's a wonderful um singer uh Cesaria Avora from Cape Verde who sings in Portuguese but she has she was this I think they called her uh you know she was this this old lady uh when she became famous and she liked to sing barefoot and you know Cape Verde is this you know it's an island off the west coast of Africa and they would sing fado which is a Portuguese um I mean it's 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 really a it's a very sad song form it's it it, it's constantly you know they're writing about kind of loss and memories and and nostalgia and that uh Cesaria of Aura is just she's terrific she became kind of well known in the uh in the I think in the in the 90s but uh but that draws from a lot of the uh again this it's closer to the Portuguese culture than Mm -hmm. Uh, than than Brazilian music, but I think that all it all comes into in that same uh, in that same cultural tradition, and you know, uh, fado and um, saudades is also it's a it's a Portuguese word that does mean sort of nostalgia or longing, um, and it's a and it's a big it's a big theme that comes up a lot in you know in Brazilian songs and and, uh, and Portuguese music. So I I would definitely definitely highlight you know Cesaria Vora is uh somebody definitely she's she's worth checking out I I'm, I don't think she's still with us anymore but definitely uh I'll send I'll send you a couple of links to some of her songs they're they're haunting and and so so sad yeah thank you I I uh I think I shared that song that I shared about love um it was Jackie Chung C-H-E-U-N-G and the song is called Wendy. Uh, I think it's WNBI. I sing Mandarin, and I actually don't mm. understand Mandarin. Went to Mandarin school from third to sixth grade after American school, and uh, it was just so beautiful. And it, it's mm. just super really sad. Um, you can probably find it on YouTube. But Jackie Chan is a is a Hong Kong singer. Mm. Um, he is the best selling Asian artist in World Music Awards. Um, as well as best supporting actor in a lot of the movies. Mm. Um, so that that song kind of reminded me of what you said about nostalgia and kind of a lost kind of love. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think it is relatable, you know, to people. Just like when <laughs> when the Bella <laughs> came out, vampire movie. <laughs> I'm thinking yeah. about. You know, I mean, it's it's targeted to the teenage uh, audience, but a yeah. lot of older people could relate to it because it's that first love, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and just like music, it just kind of reminds you of certain things. How about music that reminds you of more universal, you know, that it's more of like a surprise kind of feeling? Mm. Wow. Well, I'd, I'd say there's some uh, there's some wonderful uh, African uh, music. I mean, African music is is uh, uh, you know is is inc- incredibly rich. There's so many different different styles of it. But I, you know, I have to say that that the it, oh, I have this um, this sort of theory about you know what kind of what kind of music that I that. Uh, that appeal that will appeal to me because I have a very open kind of an open uh, you know o- open mind to any different style I mean I like st- stuff that's you know <laughs> from classical to, to stuff that's that's made to uh, today and I, I there's these it's sort of this this three uh, three factors one is if it appeals to the head uh, <laughs> second to the heart or the booty so if it's it was like really you know, so it's the head the heart and the booty so if it's if it's if it's really like intellectual or you know really interesting and it can appeal to your head um mm-hmm. if it's if it just if it's absolutely emotional you know just you know gut-wrenching in in one way or the other you know it appeals to the heart and if it may if it if it 
grooves and it makes you move, it appeals to the booty, you know? So you, you kind of, if you could get all three of those in one, you know, you, it's, uh, you know, I think that it, that's a pretty amazing feel. I, there's some, there's some African singers, I think, um, like, uh, Salif Keita, who was, um, I think I, he's, he, he's a wonderful singer. He's got a, he's got a great story because he actually comes from, he's from Mali mm -hmm. and came from a Royal family, but he's albino. And in his, in that culture, an albino is, is considered, you know, something of a curse, you know, he's, he's in, 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 in many ways, he was kind of an outcast and, and the worst possible thing that he could do with his life was to, uh, uh, was to, was to become a musician, which is even more disreputable as it, as it was, but he's become an, you know, he became an international star. And I think, you know, Peter Gabriel had, uh, had helped, uh, discover, uh, you know, help popularize some of the work that he, he had done. Uh, some, I used to play in a, a number of African bands in the, uh, you know, in the nineties when I was, a, when I was, a uh, when I was playing a lot of bass and it was, the, you know, the, the music itself is, is not, not super harmonically sophisticated so but you but there's a groove and then this and then the you know the songs tend to be pretty you know pretty memorable and pretty simple and uh you know they they always have these sort of like interlocking interlocking guitars it's it's sort of a very common thing i think people got they first heard a lot of these sounds when um paul simon in the u.s released the graceland album and uh there were a number of musicians in that uh, in that band that used to, you know fanned around new york and and i I knew I knew a number of them and uh but they you know but that the music again it's it it is kind of it's pretty universal because you don't really have to you don't have it's the 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 rhythms aren't that complex it's not like trying to dance salsa for instance or understand salsa it's <laughs> you know it's very uh you know it, it it's very straightforward very simple and it's and it's and it's happy and it, and most people that hear it they just they can just hear this you know again it's it's this incredible optimism that comes through the you know the uh you know the the the, the voices of people in you know in in certain you know countries like in in Zaire and and Ghana Cameroon there's some some wonderful musicians there so of course South Africa has uh, has you know one of the one of the richest cultures there and and Nigeria as well, um, but you know you, King Sunny Ade uh, in um, in Nigeria you have uh, Manu Dibango um, who uh, there was a, there was a he has a song called Soul Makasa I, I just heard it on the radio uh, it was uh, actually Michael Jackson had stolen some of that uh, from his on the on the off the wall record you know there was wow. a if you ever hear Mama Say, Mama Sa, Mama Say, Mama Sa, Mama Ko Sa, <laughs> he, he, he ripped that off from Mono de Bongo and Mono de Bongo sued him and I think got a, got a, got a pretty big paycheck. But, you know, this, again, it was just like, this is universal music and people, you know, the, I, I, the other thing that's really funny too is that, you know, with African music, you think of African music as being this, uh, the, um, you know, essentially it's the, it's, it's the, um, you know, it's, it's the root, uh, culture that, uh, you know, when, you know, when African slaves were, were brought over to the, uh, you know, to the West, you know, to, or to the, you know, to the new world, to North and South America, you know, that culture, the cult, the West African culture, you know, impacted, you know, impacted Brazil, but it also in the, you know, in the islands, you have all of the musical traditions in, you know, in Cuba, uh, Haiti and, um, uh, you know, the Dominican Republic and, and uh, Puerto Rico and, 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 and the islands, but also in the South, uh, that impacted uh, the blues. And you had this just incredible uh, you know, mesh of, you know, the, the African roots, the African culture, some of the African uh, traditions of certain rhythms. I mean, if you think about the um, there's the famous sort of Bo Diddley rhythm, you know, don't, 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 you know, that everybody that's listened to rock and roll has, has, has heard that yeah. rhythm, but you don't really realize that that's a, it's almost a, that's a universal rhythm pattern that goes back to, you know, African uh, traditional music, West African traditional music, where they'll have what's called a bell pattern that, that will be that pattern that goes through all the music. In Latin music, that's called the clave which is, you know, has this kind of the same, same concept. But then when you mesh, 
everything together and combine, you know, for instance, in, you know, in the American South, you had, uh, you know, you had church music, you know, you had missionaries and you had sort of Western church music that uh, combined with, you know, some of the you know, African, African traditions and, you know, African and Creole and, um, uh, and then, gospel you know and of course combine that with western classical music and then that that results in jazz but it's a, but it's amazing that a lot of contemporary african music is as much or if not even more influenced by some of the americans so james brown i mean you wouldn't might not really realize this but james brown and for you know for you know, contemporary African musicians, you know, from the, you know, from the sixties and seventies on African music was influenced by James Brown and earth, wind and fire and yeah. uh, you know, Stevie wonder, you know, probably more than anybody would realize. So it really, it's, it's amazing how, how music has become this, you know, you have these, these, these global currents of, of influence. And um, I, I'll, I'll, sh I'll share one, you know, one funny, story that I, that I learned about in, in, in this musicology class I took in college. And there was a guy that was a, uh, you know, field musicologist that would travel around and record tribes tr to try to get their, uh, to, to try to put, to record their, their traditional songs and, and, you know, you know create a, you know, create a, create a reference in in the in the work that uh, that this guy was doing. So he goes kind of deep into a uh, uh, found a like a, a pygmy village, and he recorded them. And it turns out they were singing. Uh, they said he said, he they he played the song, and it turned out to be it was the Beatles' "Let It Be." So they'd heard it. <laughs> they were singing the Beatles' "Let It Be." So this is this is sometime in the seventies. So, yeah, it, it, it is a, it is pretty amazing how you know how universal things. Are. <laughs> I have a story. My nephew was taking um, when he was in elementary school or preschool. He was in a, some kind of program, and he was learning how to sing "London Bridges," and. Uh, <laughs> in Mandarin and oh. it just doesn't sound like Mandarin though mm. so I was like what are you singing and he sang it and I was just like is that London Bridges <laughs> and it, it, it's I could I could recognize the rhythm but mm. he's you know very Americanized so <laughs> he has an accent when he speaks Mandarin mm -hmm. And I really can't tell a word he said, but I could recognize which song he is singing, though, from the beat and the rhythm and the composition, right? And yeah. that speaks to me and not the language itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. And, there's, there's, and, and what's, what's really incredible today um, about uh, you know, traditions, I think, I think it's actually important because you mentioned you know, Mandarin and you also mentioned China as a you know, uh, musicians in China, first of all, you know, my wife has, has been getting into these, uh, um, sort of these, you know, these singing competitions. And so she's been, she's been getting into all of these, you know, really interesting, uh, you know, talented songwriters, you know, that are, um, you know, that are, that are writing stuff today. I mean, there's an, an enormous generation of super talented, uh, people, but, uh, another interesting point I think that's very worth you know that's that's very worth highlighting is just how you know how deeply uh that the western classical tradition you know has been embraced and and extended on by you know some of these fantastic musicians that are coming out of uh you know coming out of Asia China in particular um I mean it's it's funny because you know we we you know we're constantly you know fighting the you know the de, you know the debates over over cutting music education and you know European classical music you know still has you know lots of uh, you know lots of, you know lots of support but it's become you know very much you know more you know the Asian kids are the ones that are that are most interested in you know fall, you know and playing this music from you know two hundred you know playing Mozart and playing Beethoven and uh, the uh, really kind of noticeable um, shift in the last, I would say, three decades is is just this emergence of just world class, you know, super talents. And I, I highlight like Yuja Wang right now. I think I think she's about thirty three, but she's she's probably you know one of the top three pianists in the world wow. right now. And uh, a guy I you know, uh, um, David Goldman 
wrote an article about her. Uh, it, was, it was an interesting article because he was kind of arguing about who, you know, who gets to carry the torch for the great Western traditions. And, and you know, he's a guy who's been a, you know, he's lived in Hong Kong for many years and he's, he's kind of an expert. And he, he talked about this concert where Yuja Wang was playing Beethoven's Hammer Clavier Sonata, which is, uh, you know, it's 45 minutes long. It's really difficult. A lot of people find it, you know, unlistenable. It's, 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 you know, they, they, they it's, it's been hugely debated the the merits of it, whether Beethoven even liked it or if he was just trying to torture pianists and just make something really difficult. And she went to Carnegie Hall. She played it. And of course she's, you know, she's young and she loves to dress in, in these kind of very revealing outfits. And, you know, she's very, she's very fashionable. And he said, he listened to her and she just brought out the, this, she played it with such mastery that, that it was a revelation to hear this, this, you know, completely, profound uh interpretation of of the work and and put it in a new light so you know i think we do have what is really amazing right now is that we we are seeing this this uh you know this rise of um sort of the non you know non uh you know english language pop uh pop stars you know as kind of on a more world scale i mean if you think about you know, listen, English is a great language to sing rock and roll and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Elvis and the Beatles and a lot of the, the you know, the, the you know, rock bands in the 70s and 80s became world famous. And, and of course, every country has their own pop yeah. stars. But but then, you know, when you start to see Psy coming out of Korea and K-pop getting so big, I mean... They, Blackpink. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, I mean, yeah, a lot of the, you know, South Korean... Uh, pop stars um, as what BTS I think is uh, they've been one of the biggest um, you know they're they're hugely popular here in the U.S. and and you know my daughter at uh, uh, at, at her high school you know here in New Jersey you know the, the kids are totally into K-pop so it is it, it's it's uh, it's a wonderful thing to see I, I I also thought it was kind of funny because you know there was um, France used to have a rule, a, a law that you would, that the radio would have to pay, play a certain proportion of uh, artists that were French. You know, they couldn't just play American or, or, you know, or British music <laughs> and, you know, they, okay. So they play Johnny Halliday and, and a few other things, but if you listen to French rock and roll, it's just, you know, French is just not a great language for rock and roll, but, um, but now there's, you know, there, there, you've had such a, you know, so much, uh, you know, cross pollination with you know folks coming from, coming from North Africa. Um, kind of forgot to mention, you know, they're you know in uh, Algeria. There were the you know the guys that do like Rai music, uh, like Cheb Khaled and uh, a few other folks like that that were you know that really you know started to, to break down the break down a lot of the barriers you know between uh, sort of Western and Eastern music. And you know when you when it comes down to a groove and it comes down to uh, you know, emotional, emotional content and feeling, you know, there you, it's, uh, it, it's, 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 it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful level playing field of, of, uh, you know, all, you know, all kinds of talent that that's, you know, that's emerging. When I was in uh, Coachella this year, um, I saw Blackpink performing and it, oh. it was awesome. They were loved, um, especially in the United States. Oh. Yeah, I mean, who would have who would have thought? I mean, uh, a couple of decades ago, uh, they, they, people just weren't exposed to music from you know pop music from different cultures, and I think it's gotten better, right? Because you know the just the the skill level and the you know the musicianship out of um, you know different cultures is, has just become tremendous. And but the I, dance, the dance is just awesome. Oh yeah, we are so in sync, right? I mean. I wanted to see the show just because of the movement. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in line with, you know, the, the song, of course. And they have to do it in unison because of mm -hmm. the band. And so that, that was like, incredible. Yeah, the choreography is, 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 is pretty, pretty awesome. I, you know, I actually experienced, was, was part of uh, some, uh, you know, cross-cultural, you know, cross uh, I would say, I don't think we were breaking ground, but when I was in, uh, in the early nineties, my, uh, you know, former college mate, uh, Jack Lee, who was a guitar player, uh, wanted to be the, 
it wanted to be the kind of the first jazz guitarist. He wanted to be the George Benson of Korea. And uh, he, he called me up and, you know, at the time I was just, a, you know, uh, just out of school and not making any money and said, Hey, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's make some, let's record some music. And, uh, you know, we, we first did some stuff with his, his, uh, his wife at the time, but, uh, you know, uh, a little after that, I, uh, ended up having a bunch of music. We recorded it. He, uh, you know, he, he played guitar and I was, I was playing bass and keyboards and, uh, violin and I, and, and the arrangements and we recorded a record and, and ended up getting signed by Warner in Korea and brought, wow. uh, brought jazz to Korea. And he was his, because the J- Japanese had been very, you know, curious and very supportive of American jazz for a long time. Uh, Korea was, was about, uh, you know, they were, they had, they had just not gotten there. And so he was, you know, and he was the first musician to really, uh, you know, bring back a whole bunch of world-class New York musicians and, and introduce jazz. And then it, then it became a lot more, uh, more fashionable. And now of course there, there, you know, there are tons of great, uh, young musicians coming out of Korea. Um, and of course, you know, China is, is, uh, you know, has, has a great history of, uh, you know, jazz that was, you know, jazz in Shanghai sort of pre, uh, you know, pre-revolution back in the thirties and forties. But, uh, you know, uh, being, being part of that was, uh, was, was a lot of fun. It was, it, 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 it took a bit, of, it was a little ahead of time, ahead of, ahead of time, but then it became, you know, the, then it did become quite, you know, quite fashionable. And now you've, you, you know, again, you've got people who are conversant and fluent in almost everything. And I think just, you know, one, one funny experience is, uh, you know, for me, it's like Japan has always, uh, embraced, uh, you know, music from you know, all over the world. And I think whatever, it's almost like whatever genre you can think of, there's like a Japanese band that's just like great at doing it, whether it be like bluegrass music or, you know, or heavy metal. But there's, there's, I went to, uh, there was a club, the, um, uh, the Latin quarter where I lived in New York and in, in the, in the nineties was a couple blocks from where I lived. And I, I went one night to go see Orchestra de la Luz, which is an all Japanese salsa band singing everything in Spanish. Oh wow! And they, and they were just crushing it. I mean, it was all, you know, it was, it was an all sort of New York Latin audience and they were, everybody was dancing salsa and these guys are great, you know, and awesome. it, it's I, just, love, I love salsa. Yeah. And merengue. And bachata. <laughs> well, salsa's salsa's harder to, uh, you know, I think it's it's harder to understand how how the beats work with salsa uh, because just because, but merengue's merengue is really easy. I mean, that's like it's kind of like bump and grind music, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I I I think salsa is more of like a flirty kind of dance. Yeah. And merengue is a little bit faster. And bachata, the interesting story about me learning bachata was that I was in, the, I went to it my friend's wedding in Sicily. And mm. uh, as soon as I got off the plane, I was driven to a pool party. <laughs> and people were, on one side, people were listening to rap. On the other side, people were dancing to bachata. Oh, cool. So, so their friend, or their cousin, taught me bachata, and I, I picked it up on the spot. It, it's just easier for me because I had a dance background in high school. Yeah, okay, that helps. Yeah, that helps a lot. So we, we did jazz, uh, we did uh, ballet, and mm. we had to uh, make up dances and perform in front of the class. Um, and after that, I did uh, East Coast Swing um, at, you know, when I was at Berkeley. Um, I thought like couple of dancing was a challenge, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but then I, you get you get used to it, and then now I can actually look at a dance and pick it up without learning it. <laughs> um, well, there's some. Do you have you ever danced the tango? Yeah, yeah, I did a, a Argentine tango um, and normal tango as well. Oh Ballroom man, dance. that's. I mean, if you want to talk about music that will just uh, kind of take your take your heart and rip it out and stomp it on the floor. Uh, yes. I'll, well, first time, and this isn't music that has lyrics, but uh, Astor Piazzolla's Nuevo Tango music. The first time I heard that, it just, it just blew me away. I mean, it's so, so powerful. The, uh, the, the bandonian player, Astor Piazzolla, who was an Italian guy from the Bronx, who's, or whose family was Argentinian. And, and he studied, with Nadia Boulanger, who was probably the 
she was probably the greatest musical pedagogue of the 20th century. I mean, she taught Aaron Copeland. She taught, taught John Cage. She taught, you know, just, just an endless list of composers. And, you know, he was writing like, you know, 12 tone music. And, and, and she said, listen, you, you got to do what's you, you, the tango is you. So he <laughs> went down to, uh, went back to Argentina and he started writing this, you know, this sophisticated music and, you know, people got very offended because he was, you know, he was taking the, you know, this incredible, uh, you know, this tradition and I, apparently cab drivers wouldn't pick them up and people like, would threaten. <laughs> but, uh, wow, what a, and I mean, think about just a, yeah, just a, a tradition that of just such, yeah, powerful. A lot uh, of passion like, as well in uh, Argentine tango. I, I first learned of the dance because I went to a Berkeley dance class or, or I don't know what I was doing and everyone was doing Argentine tango and I was just like I need to learn that so <laughs> so I would drive all the way from San Jose to all the way to Berkeley doing traffic time and by the time I get there is the advanced class uh -huh. So you know guys some of the guys not the really good ones so some of the other guys would totally make fun of me because they were like, well, you should really take beginners before you take advanced, right? Mm -hmm. But the really good guys would be like, if I'm a really good leader, you shouldn't. You don't have need to, to worry right? About exactly. <laughs> so luckily, I met a lot of the really good dancers, and I just follow, right? And if they're really good dancers who know how to lead, I do not even need to know how to dance. I can just uh. follow them. And so that's what I did when I went to Burning Man to share. You know, I, I people were doing Argentine tango, and you know, I just basically go. I went and just dance with people. You know, because if the men is a really good leader, I really don't need um, to know how to dance. <laughs> and you don't need to speak Spanish either. You know, exactly. You... I don't even need nice shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I love, I, I think, I think for me, I love Argentine tango because there's a lot of passion. The lakes are just beautiful. The dresses and the shoes. Oh my gosh. Right. Mm. And I love, I like blues dancing as well. You know, again, like you said, there's a lot of jazz. Um, it's almost like a version of salsa where salsa is very flirty, couple of dancing. Yeah. Um, blues dancing, it's a little bit different, but it's just more fusion. Mm -hmm. um, so you can have a mix of of different music that allows you to have different kinds of move and different kinds of beat. Mm -hmm. um, so and, and and I wanted to talk a little bit about rap. Um, I, I took world music at Berkeley in college, and I remember I did a paper on you know Asian rapping, and this mm -hmm. is before mm -hmm. I even visited China, right? Um, and I thought it was kind of cool that, hey, you know, we listen to rap in the United States and, you know, there are actually um, singers who are Chinese who rap in their language. But today, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of, you know, ch Chinese from China who rap in English. Um, and, you know, just like Blackpink or the boy band, I think they're getting very popular. And it, it's kind of cool to kind of see that as an Asian American, um, because you're seeing, you know, the influence of not only style, you know, but also the language, right? And, you know, right. I've been to parties here when, where someone is rapping and, you know, like, and then one of my friends was just like, oh, what is he saying? And it's in English. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it sounds like it's like some of those rock and you know rock and roll singers, right? If you could understand, <laughs> you understand what the rolling, what Mick Jagger says, you know, it's it's, uh, it's the, with rock and roll. It's to. just the music, though, right? It, it's not yeah, really yeah, yeah. what they say. You can right. kind of feel the I don't even know what you call that intensity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's you no. Know, I think that's that's right. But but rap is 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 it's amazing how. Uh, you know how persistent it is, and and how uh, you know just how it's 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 spread over. Uh, you know, I mean, as a as a cultural, I mean, sort of as a cultural phenomenon. You think about hip hop and rap from the, mm -hmm. you know, from the U.S. I mean, this the 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 idea is it was I forget who who described it as like CNN from the streets, but I think you know that was you know some of the early you know early hip hoppers from. Uh, you know, from the Bronx and, and, you know, then you had sort of the West Coast, 
crew and then you have you know more the you know the conscious rappers but i mean it's it you know every in every culture where that's adopted too it's it's about you know the you know the the connection between the uh you know be, between the performers and and you know and their culture is is so i mean it's so it's so intimate right because they're reflecting their you know they're they're reflecting their experience and mm -hmm. it that's it's it's it, it ends up being such a you know such a such a powerful way to you know to connect and you know and really tie together a, a culture um, who's your favorite you know, from, rap uh rapper rapper well i'm pretty old school i gotta say i like you know i i like to pat i like <laughs> I do, you know. I mean, I because I love I love the West Coast grooves, but uh, you know, I, there were there were a bunch of guys. I you know I loved N.W.A. and Biggie and and uh, you know I I really enjoyed Kendrick Lamar stuff. There's um, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a whole bunch of whole bunch of good guys. There's actually one guy, uh, Michael Kedigan, who has freestyled on on technology. Who's uh, who's who's really remarkable. Pretty you know pretty amazing. Yeah, he was. Uh, he's he's in the show. Uh, we spoke about yeah. journalism. He's pretty amazing. But for rapping, oh, he's he remind me of storytelling. Yeah, he's he's amazing. No doubt. I I think. Uh, yeah, and just the ability to you know to uh you know to to rhyme and just to to you know to create a you know create narrative i mean again it kind of goes back to you know the the role of the i mean it it's it's still you know it's i mean rap is african american in its its in its origins right you actually all, you almost you go back to the the the, the role of the griot right in in you know in, in in certain west african cultures you you know the griot was the uh it was the repository of all of the history and all of the wisdom and and the uh you know and, and essentially t telling the important stories of you know the culture and you know that role in uh, you know, in in American music and in American culture, it's has has it's amazing how it's translated so effectively. You know, globally. I mean, I think every every culture, or every every major country has uh, you know has its own rappers. Yeah, I I love uh, J Cole now. It's so someone was making fun of me when we went to Burning Man, <laughs> and made me listen to every like a few of J Cole's song and tell him what it means. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I luckily have passed the test, um, but I love how his songs have very deep meanings. Mm -hmm. um, and I think rap in the U.S. has evolved, you know, from from very materialistic stuff and stories of neighborhoods um, to relationships and deep for meanings um, mm -hmm. storytelling. Um, how about electronic music? You know, I discover electronic music a lot when I go to Coachella. You know, yeah. sometimes I would walk into a stage and and I'm just amazed uh, by the music. So no words, uh, yet you can feel stuff. <laughs> Well, you're talking about like like EDM, right? I mean, there's the yeah. sort of the, the DJ the DJ culture. I mean, I you know I gotta say I, I you know I enjoy some of that. I've never gotten really that deep into it. It's it's always sort of weird to me to see the uh, I guess the ritual of a concert. I mean, you think of you 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 like to see musicians that are you know playing instruments and and uh, you know kind of. Uh, you know, expressing expressing emotions of one sort or another on a stage or an audience getting into it, and and when you look at EDM, it's like some guy twisting a knob and then like kind of <laughs> waving their hand, over and they, they twist another knob. I was like, okay, well, it's, it's cool, it sounds great, but it's like it 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 does seem to be a little bit of a disconnect. But but I think there's some, I mean, there's some uh, amazing uh innovations that have that have happened, you know, in, <laughs> among the among DJ culture, and you really think about it too. It's like it, it does. I mean, EDM is, you know, has, has been just, a, I mean, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it's another evolution of, um, you, know, te you know, techno obviously in the nineties just became very, I mean, electronica, I think really emerged in the kind of seventies and eighties and then, and then, you know, then uh, kind of moved into, you know, house and, and um, I mean, there's so many different, uh, you know, so many different variations of, of, uh, of dance music. But what's, what's pretty cool now is that you've had the, the technology itself has evolved so much where it, it, you know, you've, you've got all these, uh, um, 
uh, you know, you know, different types of instruments that you can play really that are, you know, whether they're controllers, if you're, if you're doing, you know, Ableton, for instance, that, you know, it's, it's an open source software platform that people use and, and, you know, folks that started doing like laptop, uh, you know, laptop bands uh, and it's, <laughs> it's become a whole different, you know, it's, it's a whole different thing. And um, a buddy of mine who ran a club in the nineties really started curating some of these guys like uh, DJ Spooky and, you know, where DJs become essentially sound collage artists rather than, you know, rather than working with sort of primary sources. I mean, I, I have to say, like, my personal taste is I like primary sources because I like to see music. I like musicians who are playing or singing or, you know, creating instruments. But I also, but you also realize that the tool set has evolved as well, too, right? And great DJs who are, uh, you know, who take mater source material and, you know, and essentially refactor it or, or you know, uh, disaggregate music and, and kind of recompose it are, you know, they're artists, you know, they're, they're, they're a different, it's a different kind of art, different way of expressing themselves. And it's, uh, it is pretty amazing just how big it is too. And, and I, I think from a, <laughs> From a financial standpoint, it's amazing how much some of these DJs make. I mean, they're like the they're they're the uh, they're they've got like the, some of these guys are the highest grossing artists. I mean, you think about um, uh, who was the uh, Calvin Calvin Harris, name? Calvin Harris, right, and Steve Aoki and yes. uh, folks like that. I mean, uh, Skrillex and and folks like that. I mean, they I <laughs> I, met, I met somebody who was a uh, uh, a financial advisor was to, who just told me the amount of money these guys were making. It's like, holy moly, they don't have to, you know, all they have to do is basically this, you know, they don't even have to, like DJs used to have to travel with their albums. Like if you were in the seventies, you know, you'd have to have like, you know, a couple hundred pounds of crates of vinyl, you know, that you'd be spinning. But these days, you know, a lot of, they can, these guys can travel a lot lighter and it's not like traveling with a, with a band where you have to bring, you know, you got two semis full filled with amplifiers and lighting and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's, that's complicated to mount a tour like that, but uh, it, it is really incredible the way they, you know, they, these guys are able to touch and, and the great and the, and the, and the really great ones are able to just, you know, read a crowd and just create this, you know, create this excitement and, uh, you know, touch people in, 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 so, you know, such a, such an impactful way. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's the ultimate in, in music scalability right now. Cause you know, the industry itself, I mean, you think about it as a, um, we, th we were talking again, we sort of started talking about this as a language, but it used to be that there was so, so much friction to be able to discover music if you had to buy an album or if you had to have somebody play it you know you had to listen to the radio or you had to go somewhere where there's an album or a tape you know you'd have to find a physical medium to hear it and now you know it's music's everywhere it's it's accessible so <laughs> and we, we come back to the the importance of the experience and you know i was just just saying to somebody the other day like think about you know a hundred years ago or 150 years ago, even before the wax cylinders, like if you, the only time you would ever get to hear music was if somebody played it. And if you <laughs> wanted to hear something twice, you had to have, somebody had to play it twice. And it, and now, you know, when you, you get back to, you know, the, the, the kind of the importance of, of experience again, it's like live music is, is really where, you know, where, where we can, where we still connect despite how the, you know, the economics of recorded music, I mean, that may have just in the, you know, in the broad historical context, that might have just been a, you know, that might have been a few decades where, where people actually made music from recorded, you know, re recorded media. But now, you know, it, it, it comes back to the, the personal experience. You know, the, I like, I like stomp as well and how you can make music from everyday objects. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what, <laughs> this is so cool. Um, and, and there is, uh, um, you know, you know, who's interesting, really interesting is, 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 is Farrell Williams. He, uh, apparently had one of his little tricks of the trade is he has a collection of, of pots and pans and, <laughs> and things that he uses in the studio. Cause you, I mean, if you're recording anything like it, you don't have to be playing a drum set, you play anything. So yeah. apparently, yeah. When he's, um, like if you listen to like blurred lines, I mean, that's him, you know, he, he 
creates these beats just using stuff that he's found. And if you record it, it, it should sound good if it's a good musician playing it. So that's, there is, that it is an amazing thing that, you know, music is, it's all around us. There's some folks that have been doing some stuff at the music, uh, at the uh, MIT media lab. I, 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 I don't recall offhand who's, um, who's been doing, you know, there, but there, uh, I've, there have been a couple of really interesting folks doing, doing work on, uh, kind of interactive, uh, devices that will kind of read, uh, the environment around you and, and, and create music as a uh, sort of just as, as, as part of life. And, you know, kind of the last, you know, last thing that's probably worth, you know, highlighting too is that, you know, John Cage, uh, who the kind of the famous composer who I got a chance to meet when he, I had a phys- philosophical confrontation with him uh, <laughs> when I was, in in college and it was it was a funny you know it was it was one of these things about perspective where the yeah, i you know here, here's this legendary composer who was uh you know coming to columbia to do a a, a master class and he was you know he was sort of artist in residence for a week and you know they were gonna they were gonna do this performance um so i go to this performance which was uh you know, they several hundred people in this um, in this gymnasium at Barnard College, and there was uh, they were playing Eric Satie's Vexations, which was just this kind of solo piano piece that just noodles around for a couple of hours. They had somebody reading sort of random word. They'd like throw the dice and read some random words, and um, uh, they would, uh, you know, they would intersperse it with an occasional, you know, funny little story. And then some, uh, some woman walks around singing French cabaret songs. And I, I, you know, I thought, wow, this is, this is cool for the first 30 minutes. And then after 60 minutes, after 90 minutes, I just got, I like, this is ridiculous. This is stupid. It's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. I, I got, I got in a huff and I just walked out and then I, you know, the, the next day, <laughs> You know, I, I, uh, my, uh, I had this orchestration teacher. I said, well, what did you think about it? I mean, this seemed like the, seemed like the squarest guy that I could ever, and he said, oh, I thought it was very relaxing. It's like, oh, huh. <laughs> really? So at the end of the week, he, uh, you know, he, he actually did a, a, another opera, a similar sort of weird little uh, performance, but it was timed to, to be 44 minutes. And he basically kept a clock and at 44 minutes, it was over. So after that, I went up and I, t- uh, you know, it was, it was, again, it was a lot of sort of some dance and weird little toy instruments and, you know, people telling funny stories about Merce Cunningham. And, uh, but I went up to him and I, I said, ah, Mr. Cage. He said, yes. I said, that was, he said, thank you. Huh? <laughs> It was. So that kind of opened it all up, man. I, I, uh, and after a while I got into all this avant-garde music and this crazy stuff. And, you know, you got to think about like, you know, I- interesting artists like, like Yoko Ono and the whole Fluxus movement and, you know, folks that are, that are, you know, that just allow music to be what it is. I mean, when Cage wrote four minutes and 33 seconds, which is that famous piece that's basically somebody sitting at a piano for 44 minutes and 33 seconds with, and not playing it, you know, it does, <laughs> it does sort of shift the, shift the aperture. So you start listening to what's around you and realize that, yeah, I mean, everything's music. So Ed, uh, with that, what is that one piece of advice that you would want to provide to the community about music? Well, I would say uh, always be curious never never be uh, never be closed minded about uh new music and or something that somebody likes <laughs> or something in a different language <laughs> something in a different language that's right i mean just you never know where something is can uh can surprise you uh i mean i think everybody has their own tastes so the, you know you're you know, embrace your taste and embrace what you like. But I think if uh, somebody recommends something, uh, always give it a listen. You know, it's sort of like food. You know, it's it's like food, air, and uh, uh, and and love all at once, right? Wow, if, uh, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So enjoy and 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 share and remember too that 
uh, you know, the more you give, the more it expand, the, the more it multiplies. So share what you love and, and, and enjoy, enjoy what people share with you. Thank you, Ed. Thanks for joining us. Great, Michelle. Always a pleasure talking to you. Okay. Bye-bye. You bet.